is going to be notes video one for um, April 5th, and I have April 5th for Unit 12. We were in the middle of Watergate today. We kind of stopped with the resignation, resignation of the Vice President in the middle of all the Watergate scandal uh, business. We're picking up now with some other developments that are happening at the same time in 1973 while the Watergate trial is going on. Uh, one was the War Powers Act. After the whole debacle with Cambodia and the end of the Vietnam War, Congress didn't want to see the president have unlimited power again when it came to a war. And so Congress passed this act called the War Powers Act in 73 over Nixon's veto uh, and now required the president to notify Congress within 48 hours before they took military action. In addition to that, you also have to uh, have con Congress approve of troops being in a territory longer than 90 days. So this is, this is still in effect today, but this is a big change in policy where the president you know, is now restricted as commander-in-chief that he has to tell Congress within 48 hours of an attack and then also notify, has to keep them there. To, in order to be able to keep them there longer than 90 days, Congress has to be able to okay it, um, which you know, uh, uh, impacts us like in the, in the modern day like Afghanistan and Iraq war too. But just that's something to be aware of. So that's a direct rea reaction to like Nixon in Cambodia and it, this comes out in 1973. Nixon didn't like it, obviously, but it's still the law of the land as of today. The other big issue that develops in 73, which is going to hurt the economy, which is the uh, war going on in the Middle East called the October War, which leads to an OPEC embargo. We mentioned OPEC before in Union 11. Now we're going to see where it really starts to hurt us. So another war broke out in the Middle East in 1973. Uh, Israel was at the center of the conflict. Israel's fighting several other countries, including Egypt and uh, other countries that neighbored it, like um, Syria and those guys. Nixon ordered U.S. forces on alert and to give $2 billion worth of money to Israel. So we're basically giving money and aid over to Israel while they're fighting this war. OPEC didn't like the fact that we're helping them out, and OPEC has begun to realize how dependent we've become as a culture upon foreign oil. And so... In the fall of 1973, OPEC cut us off from, our, from the oil over there. So OPEC's 1973 oil embargo on us was a direct response to us helping out Israel. Most of the OPEC countries were Muslim-based and were fighting against Israel and, and didn't care um, for the fact that we were helping them out. So they cut our oil off, which greatly hurts us back home. This caused a worldwide shortage of oil once they put the embargo on us and other countries, and it created very long lines at the gas stations and the fuel pumps. Um, it, it now created runaway inflation back home, so this is going to add to the inflation and make inflation worse in 1973. So the economy just kind of started getting a little bit better under some of Nixon's policies, but now it has even worse issues because of this uh, gas shortage in 1973. You also see the economy suffer from things like a loss of manufacturing jobs and a lower standard, standard of living as well, too. So a, a lack of blue-collar jobs in general. Um, as a direct result of this boycott in 73, Americans begin to buy more foreign cars. So we begin to buy less American-made cars and more foreign-made because they're more fuel-efficient. So this is when the switch takes place. Most Americans bought American-made cars up until the 70s, but when you had these there's actually, this is the first one, there's going to be a second oil embargo in 79. These two embargoes are going to lead to us getting, buying more foreign-made cars, which is going to in turn hurt manufacturing of jobs, uh, manufacturing jobs here in the United States as a result. Um, so it does cost jobs once people begin to buy foreign cars here in the United States. Um, no program Congress developed under Nixon or even the future guys will fix this sluggish economy. So. Because of OPEC, you're going to deal with about seven, eight years of a sluggish economy with high inflation that whatever, no matter what we do, it seems like we can't fix it. Now, the OPEC embargo only lasts a few months. It, they're going to return the oil to us in 1974, but they start selling it back to us at four times the price because now they realize how important it is to us by this point. So by 74, they're now charging us. They, they return the oil, but they're charging us at four times the price, so it still affects our economy and hurts us for the rest of the decade. So all that's kind of happening on top of Watergate. So the economy is doing poorly. Then you have Vietnam wrapping up, which people are happy it's over with, but people don't feel good about it because it wasn't really a win for us. And you have Watergate on top of that too. So back to Watergate, the whole res res uh, resignation and so on in the line. Okay. All right. So 
In October of 73, you had this famous event called Saturday Night Massacre. One of the special prosecutors involved in the Watergate scandal who worked for the Justice Department was Archibald Cox. Nixon didn't care for the way that Archibald Cox was investigating the Watergate scandal, and he asked the Attorney General to, to, force, to get this guy fired. The Attorney General refused to fire Archibald Cox, um, so the Attorney General and the Assistant Attorney General both quit uh, or basically were fired because they wouldn't fire this guy. So eventually the third guy, the, the guy who's going to become the new Attorney General, will fire Archibald Cox. But because you have all these firings take place back to back to back in the Justice Department, it's going to be labeled as a Saturday Night Massacre, which just makes Nixon look worse and looks even more guilty involved in this. And it also creates kind of a conundrum because Nixon is the, is the boss of the same people who are investigating him. So it makes things kind of um, odd when it goes through all these investigations. So in the spring of 74, uh, Congress begins to talk about doing an impeachment proceeding if, if Nixon doesn't produce enough evidence. And so finally in the spring of 74, Nixon releases the transcripts, not the actual tapes themselves. He releases the transcripts of the conversations on these tapes in the spring of 74 which they've been heavily edited. So there's like large chunks of these conversations that have been edited out and been blanked out from what was said. So people, so Congress is not satisfied from what they get from what they, they get from uh, from these from these tape these tape transcripts. So finally by the summer in July of 74, the third branch weighs in, the Supreme Court and basically rules that Nixon cannot cite executive privilege, he has to hand over the tapes. So in July of 74, Nixon is forced to hand the tapes over to Congress, which there are actually parts of the tapes that are just erased and deleted. Um, we don't know exactly why it happened the way it did, but there's enough evidence on the, the tapes that suggests that Nixon did know about the cover-up and was involved in the cover-up. We never know to the greatest extent of what he did know, but there's enough evidence to prove that he was part of the cover-up. So in the late July of 74, the House of Representatives moves to impeach Nixon. They, they're going to impeach him on three things obstruction of justice, abuse of power, and contempt of Congress. Because they had enough evidence now to basically prove Nixon was uh, impeachable or guilty. So, because he knew pretty much it was going to happen, Nixon decides to resign the office instead on August 9th. So August 9th, 1974, Richard Nixon is the first and only president to resign the office. Um, of president. So he's going to leave. You can see a picture of him. This is right before he gets on, this, on his helicopter. He takes off and leaves. Um, Vice President Ford takes over as a result. So Gerald Ford, Gerald Ford takes over as president after, the, after Nixon leaves. So the significance of all of this, um, the positive from Watergate is that it proved checks and balances work. That Nixon said one thing with the tapes, Congress said another thing, but the Supreme Court came in and basically overruled Nixon and said, no, you got to give them over. So it shows the checks and balances system does work. Um, it does also show the dangers of having power unchecked and showing how the president having too much power can be dangerous um, because the, the president has gotten more and more power since FDR has been in office. And so you see what kind of um, issues that might lead to, and you, see, you still see those issues even now with the most recent presidencies. The biggest result, though, of Watergate is that people, again, lose faith in the government. They become untrusting the government even more. And now, by 74, you have the failure of Vietnam, you have Watergate, and you have the OPEC stuff. So the, America's just in a very low point in 1974-75 once all these things conclude, and they just don't trust the government. They don't trust um, what's been ha you know, what the government's been doing and just feel like America's just on the wrong path in general. But that's what you kind of see here happen with Watergate and so on. So that's Senator Nixon um, with Watergate. And like I said, if he just had gotten on his own way, he'd probably been a lot better off. So Nixon takes, I mean, Nixon leaves, Ford takes over. We're going to go through Ford pretty quickly. There's not a whole lot you need to know about Ford in general. Uh, Gerald Ford is the, is the first and only president never to really be elected. Um, even when we had VPs take over in the past, they always were elected on the same ticket as the president, but he's the only president ever appointed during the middle of a term, or the VP appointed during the middle of the term, and then becomes the president. Um, in fact, it, it was only just possible because the 25th Amendment only got passed in the 60s, and it allowed the president to appoint a replacement VP in case something happens, and so that works out for Ford. Ford becomes the president, and he serves out the remainder of Nixon's second term for about two and a half years or so. Um, 
he had served in the House. He was from Michigan. He was very likable, unpretentious. Uh, people wondered if he would be a good president because he hadn't been tested yet. Um, but the problem with Ford is that he immediately ruins any kind of goodwill that he has towards him by pardoning Nixon. So by August of 74, 25, 26 aides of Nixon have been convicted and are going to be go to serve jail time over the, the White House scandal, the Watergate scandal. But Ford, in September of 74, pardons Nixon for any crimes that he may have committed in the Watergate scandal. Because, and it makes a lot of sense, Ford wanted to pardon him so the country could move on. The country was still very much bogged down in all these proceedings, and he wanted the country to move forward and be done with Watergate. So it makes sense, but a lot of people wanted Nixon's head to roll and wanted Nixon to see justice, and that won't happen here in, um, with, with Nixon. So, so Ford does kind of hurt himself right off the bat by pardoning Nixon and making a lot of people upset with him because he does this. Um, all right, the failure of U.S. policy in Southeast Asia. Ford cannot secure extra funds to help South Vietnam in 74 because their conflict kept getting worse and worse there. And so it became difficult to help support Vietnam and Saigon. So in 1975, in April, Saigon falls. The, the, the capital of South Vietnam, Saigon, falls to the North Vietnam. And so as of 1975, uh, Vietnam is going to be one whole country again, and now it's going to be completely communist. And so even though we had been gone for two years by this point, Americans felt like this was the final nail in the coffin, and we had officially lost the Vietnam War because all those reasons why we fought and died for were out the window now because Vietnam was now split and was now completely communist. So we evacuated out Americans. You see pictures here of Americans getting evacuated out of our embassy here from the helicopter. We also helped evacuate 150,000 Vietnamese people who had supported the United States and faced persecution under the new regime. Um, so this, so when, when Saigon falls and Vietnam falls, it does mark a low point in American prestige abroad and our confidence. And so it takes us a while to kind of regain our confidence as a country, especially when it comes to war and the military and so forth. Um, on a side note, you do, see, you do see a little bit of that domino theory occur with Cambodia. In 1975, Cambodia fell to a radical communist group called the Khmer Rouge. So the Khmer Rouge, led by Pol Pot, um, led this revolution in Cambodia and took over the, the, the country of Cambodia and made it communist. But this guy was a very brutal dictator. When Pol Pot came into power, he led a massive genocide and killed over a million of his own people. Um, Ford ordered an attack on a naval base that had captured a U.S. merchant ship. There was a merchant ship called the Mayaguez that had been captured as an American merchant ship off the coast of Cambodia that was captured by Cambodian forces. So... Ford had to send in Marines to go liberate this U.S. merchant ship and get those guys off. It freed 39 hostages, but 38 Marines got killed in the Mayaguez incident. So um, 39 hostages were, were freed from this uh, extraction, but 38 Marines were killed in this process as well. Uh, and then general results from Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, some countries did follow communism, like Laos and Cambodia and Vietnam, but other ones did not. Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, all began to thrive and became successful economic markets uh, that we trade with even now. So, you know, people kind of say, you know, maybe the Vietnam War did help. Maybe because we showed up here and helped to kind of stall the spread of communism in Vietnam for about a decade or so, it essentially allowed for those other countries to kind of catch up, for countries like Singapore, Thailand to kind of get better so they weren't so susceptible to uh, communist influence. Because remember, they were colonies at one point of European countries. So once they decolonize, uh, they're kind of unstable. And so basically by us being involved in Vietnam, it gave them time to kind of develop as a country and become economic successful. So at the time that we're not there anymore, they're not so susceptible to communist influence as a result. Um, and they're able, more able to resist that influence. So I'm going to stop first video there, and we're going to go to the video two for the rest of the notes.